welcome to this episode of Burning Questions. Uh, today, I am pleased to present Sarah Duchovny and Clay Hilly. Uh, both of them appeared with us in our uh, production of Pagliacci last fall, so we're very excited to welcome their, them here today. How are you guys? We're great. Doing great, thanks. How are you? Good. I am. I'm wonderful. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in and start asking you guys some questions. And I'm going to get the uh, question that everybody wonders out of the way first. You guys travel around in your RV. Um, what is that like? And how do you manage to uh, stay sane with each other in that small space? Well, um, we love it. And we're so happy that um, you know, we can be in our home and uh, social distance in our little comfort area and, you know, just be wherever we need to be. It's not very small. It's what, 300 and... Yeah, it's about yeah, 375 feet. Uh, That's a studio feet apartment. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> so it's like a studio apartment and we have doors. So it's more like a one but small bedroom, small one bedroom apartment. Yeah. Great. So we have a big bathroom with like laundry facilities and stuff like uh, we wow. have two TVs, we have a big TV in the bedroom, a big TV in the living room, and then a big TV actually outside attached uh, so so we can, like, watch TV outside. So if we wow. feel like we need, like, alone time, we just, like, go to our separate TVs. Yeah, there That's are people, good. Yes, there are studio apartments, you know, in New York where people are quarantined that are much smaller than this, and, like, you know, the lockdown is way... Is obviously way tighter in a petri dish like New York City, unfortunately. Yeah, and you guys are out in nature, York. so yeah. yeah and, and and our life is actually become actually not much different than it would be any other time that we're between gigs. So this is just kind of yeah kind of how we live anyway. <laughs> we usually just hang out in the camper and like you know do our things at home if we're not actively rehearsing. Clay, okay, so for, for people who might not be sure what this is, your voice is categorized as a Heldon tenor. Um, can you explain what that means? Well, Heldon tenor is the kind of, the specific type of tenor that sings the music of Mahler, Strauss, and Wagner primarily, has like a specialization in that. That also, it also bleeds over into the heroic works of of Verdi and Puccini and Lancavallo, as, as in the case of Pagliacci, and um, yeah, these other composers that wrote, you know, strenuous music. They wrote heavily orchestrated music, lots of times in the brass section, um, or even even with other sections of the orchestra, the music is, is so opulently composed, like it requires a tenor with, I don't know, the layman's term would be like, you know, has like a lot of punch to it. You know, the, the, your throat is arranged, you know, by God in such a way that that you know, the thickness of the thickness of, of of your vocal cords combined with like the resonating chamber of this big old head of mine <laughs> results in like you know a punched sound that can like you know cut through that that thick orchestration. So that's yeah, required. it's okay. You can say you have a big voice. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Why well, say in one word what you can say in like seventy or eighty? I don't know. <laughs> Exactly. Um, it's big and beautiful. So yeah, I think um, it having you sing at Opera Road Oak, um, we have so many, so many wonderful singers come through Opera Road Oak and I just, your voice is so unique and it's just really, um, it really kind of shakes the rafters. So it, it's one that I had not um, yet heard before you came to Opera Road Oak. So we're very glad to have you, um, which kind of brings me to my next question. Um, you've performed at Opera Roanoke, but also you've performed at some of the biggest opera houses in the world, uh, like Lyric Opera of Chicago, the Metropolitan Opera, the Washington National Opera, and of course in Europe. Um, what, in, what is that like? What is it like? I'm, it's the dream. It's the pinnacle. It is what we all in our little, little sophomore and freshman voice classes and undergrad you know really you know dream about and uh you know to rub shoulders with all these with all these great musicians and you know great conductors and coaches um it's it's nothing short of it's nothing short of the pinnacle and i'm very fortunate to to have to have, to have been there in 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 several of those houses you mentioned uh, so, uh um the met i have not actually been on stage yet i've only been in understudy capacity and the same with um, same with San Francisco. 
but you could go on stage at any moment. That's true. That's true. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, anything could have happened, and I could have gone on. And that's, of course, a, a, you know, it's a unique, a, a unique set of stresses and concerns and whatever. Because you're like, well, I haven't actually had this on as I haven't put this in my body the way that the main cast that I've been observing has 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 been doing. But um, but I, I don't know. I, I think I'm I think I'm sort of I think I'm built for that challenge. I I had a strong instrumental background musical preparation background um you know from 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 a really young age so um so it's i think it's i think it's the best way to say it i it's a, it's a privilege it's an honor and it is it is the pinnacle yeah so um sarah i want to move on to you and ask you a couple of questions um yeah. you sort of have an affinity for new music and you've had the opportunity to originate at least two roles that i know about from your bio um what's it like to be the first person to perform a role well in some ways there's a huge amount of pressure and then in some ways there isn't the kind of pressure that you have with a role that has like an expectation a performance practice um it's tricky though because you're doing something that's never been done before um the score hasn't really had a chance to be like through the rigors of um editing and different singers different you know uh conductors saying okay like this is what you mean but let's rewrite this in a way that is a little easier to read or makes more sense um on paper so you're kind of like an explorer like putting together like what you see on the page and making what the composer wants come to life um and I was really lucky with Middlemarch and Spring that we actually got a second performance. So the premiere happened, I think, in 15. And then two years later, um, Charlottesville Opera picked it up. So that was a really cool experience to be able to come back and revisit something. Um, with a more mature voice, understanding the uh, the character more, and like having the music have like those two years to like percolate. And I thought that, you know, it would have left my brain, but when you learn something like that, it never really leaves you. So it was really cool to like open the score and be like, it's still in here, all right, <laughs> like let's do this. So that was really great. Um, but oftentimes you just never get to do it again. So you've poured your soul and hours and like brain power into learning this thing. And then, you know, that's it, it's done. So it's, um, it's a cool experience. And, you know, it's always kind of like that exciting gamble to be like, okay, is this gonna be like a thing that I do again? Or will this be, you know, just a, a one moment in time kind of thing? Yeah. Do you get to work with the composers and the librettists at all when you're doing yeah. that? Yeah, absolutely. And that's really great because, you know, how many times have we like looked at a score and thought like, oh, I wonder what like, you know, Mozart really wanted here. You can't ask him. But um, yeah, being able to ask the composer, the librettist, like, why or like what color are you looking for here yeah. and then um I wasn't part of the premiere but two years ago I did Wozo's Ghost um with Michael Ching and he was the conductor so composer and wow. conductor, and we did it um you know in combination with Johnny Skiki as a double bill and that was fun because um you know we were like doing our little coaching and at the end he was like do you, want, do you want to sing a high D here? Like, it's not written, but do, do you want to sing it? And I was like, sure, why not? So just having the, the composer just be like, if you want to do it here, I give you my blessing. And we just did it. <laughs> yeah, so it seems like um, you almost get to leave a little piece of your artistry in the character, which can be very exciting. Um, so every person who sings the role after you is going to say, well, what did Sarah do? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> My legacy. Um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the other part of your life, which is um, something a lot of artists do, but I think you have uh, figured out a way to do it really well, and that is you're sort of an entrepreneur, so you're a pretty active blogger, and you even have your own business selling antique jewelry. Tell us how you got started doing that, and, and what's that, what that is like alongside your career as a performer. 
Yeah. So I have always kind of been like a serial entrepreneur. It never felt like, okay, I need a side hustle. What is my side hustle going to be? It was always like, I had this desire to like, just kind of try out different business things. I enjoy it. It's, it's fun for me. And I also love writing. So for a while, it seemed like all of my interests were kind of like spread out. Like I love singing. I love jewelry. I love business. I love writing. And now I feel like everything has like kind of coalesced. So I think of it more as like, building a personal brand the way um like a pop singer or an actor would you know they have their endorsements and they're you know of course this is on a smaller scale but um but i've always believed that artists should um you know be like you know a, a well-rounded um we should have a well-rounded business model so the last question I want to ask you guys is something you probably get asked a lot, but um, I, maybe I'll go back to you, Clay. You can tell me what it's like to be married to another artist. <laughs> and I'll, I'll get Sarah's answer next. <laughs> well, I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> <laughs> look, it's great so cute. Have, look, it's great to have someone who understands that, um, that, you know, since she lives it herself, I mean, we got rehearsals late into the night. Sometimes there's going to be swaths of time where we don't get to spend, you know, as much time as we'd like around each other. There's also times, uh, you know, there's times in the in the morning when 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 maybe she'd rather sleep, but I've got to warm up and <laughs> and I've got to whatever. Maybe there's an audition, maybe there's a rehearsal, yeah. maybe there's a, maybe there's something going on, a cover run or something, and um and you know, vice versa. If I, sometimes whatever, maybe I want to sleep in, but she's got to sing. Whatever, it's fine. And, um, but it's just, these, these are the things we understand. We have, you know, we have, every singer has a multitude of singer family. You know, your adopted, mm -hmm. your adopted network of, of, of singer pals. Well, now, like, we have these concentric circles that, you know, that overlap. And it's just, you know, we have all the same friends and we have, you know, obviously, clearly, obviously, by the question, <laughs> we have the same interests. And I, um, I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. No, it's really funny. Sarah, but do you agree? I do. I absolutely agree. And, you know, it's funny because everyone's like, oh, a tenor. Like, what's that like? Right. But Clay is like such an even keeled um, person and and such a um, such a calm singer that just kind of living the artist life with him has influenced you know, my mindset around performing. So I used to be like, you know, a little more neurotic about things and like have like my little like, you know, I, I must do this before an audition and I have to do this before a performance. And living with Clay every day and just seeing how like calm and centered he is before performances or before auditions has rubbed off on me in a really positive way. So I think a lot of people think like, oh, like, you know, two singers together, like, you know, there must be so much like drama, <laughs> like, you know, so, so much, yeah, drama whenever. But um, I think for me, it's really been the opposite of just like this calming effect of like opera is something we do every day. It's our job but like there's no need to freak out about it you know yeah <laughs> well it's like just two people having the same job you know exactly. it can be challenging at times but it, but I also think it's wonderful that you have someone that you can you know come home to every day and that knows exactly what you're going through and can relate and you guys can talk and and right. you know and have your own separate spaces yeah. as well so uh, well it's wonderful you guys are just the cutest things ever and um, we've loved having you at Opera Roanoke and and we really hope that you can come back someday and sing again um, either separately or as a couple it's both it's both wonderful so thank you so much for talking to me today i really appreciate it we loved it thanks brooke <laughs> yeah you guys stay safe you too <laughs> bye bye, bye.